Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. I pray that your word would change us. I pray that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit to, to penetrate deeply into our hearts, into our bodies, into our minds, to change who we are, transform who we are. That in all times, but especially in times of crisis, when the world is going crazy, that we would be stout-hearted Christians, immovable, steadfast, content, happy, and generous, because we're filled with your Spirit, and we don't fear anything that can happen to us. Because you are God, and we love you. So we pray all these things, and ask that the preaching of your word would grow us in spirit and in truth. Amen. So, Isaac preached on the parable of the tenants last week. I do want to just reference it in the beginning. Let me read it here for you. Um, because our chap where I'm preaching, it picks up kind of in the middle of the showdown with the scribes and the Pharisees. He's already cleansed the temple. It's been a day. Now he's come back into the temple. And the scribes and Pharisees are trying to find some way to get him the heck out of Jerusalem, get rid of him, kill him, do something, because he's drawing away all the people after himself. He is fulfilling his role as the Messiah, and the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, they all know it. They know that he's the Messiah, and they're scared about that. what that means for them, because they have already pitted them, themselves against him. It would be kind of like this. You know uh, how we live in kind of a heightened bipartisan time? Imagine somebody um, running for president or whatever who's not affiliated with any party that everybody likes and is winning not just the popular vote but the electoral vote you would see the entire existing system turn against that individual because the biggest threat to the whole political system is someone who's independent from the existing political system. That's why all of politics in America, at least, we want someone to fit neatly onto one category or another. And that's the way that would be like they had that in that day. There were scribes, there were Pharisees, there were Herodians, there were elders. They each had their own kind of flavor, and Jesus was like none of them. Like none of them. And so they're going to try to pin Jesus down into a specific party so that they can then slap labels on him and dismiss him. So that he can be part of the regular political process. And he's totally disinterested. So it starts... It starts in, in chapter 11 with the scribes and the Pharisees coming to him and saying, whose authority are you using to do these things? To cleanse the temple, to teach the people. You're stepping in like you're someone who, who has some authority. Tell us who's given it to you. Because the truth is, nobody had except for God. He couldn't say, well, the governor told me I have, you know, here's my thing that tells you I can go about doing God's business. So Jesus just pushes a question back to them. Everybody knew that John was a prophet from God. There were no scandals. There were no nothing. There was no way that they could bring the ministry of John the Baptist down. Furthermore, he was killed early in a crazy political thing. And and so he was like a martyr to the people. So Jesus just flipped it back on them and said, well, why don't you tell everybody about what you think about John? Because John was also independent from the system. He never made his way to Jerusalem. He was kind of wise, stayed out in the, in the boonies. People came to him. The scribes and the Pharisees never came and got baptized by him. They never joined his little thing to repent of sin. Well, there amongst all the people, they couldn't say, oh, we don't think John's it. They were kind of trapped. And so they said, well, we're still not sure. Jury's still out on that one. So then Jesus starts. There's, there is not just a battle of wills, a battle of wits, but Jesus is starting to drop big statements, not only to the Pharisees, but also to the people about what's about to happen. 
Because Jesus knows what's about to happen. This is going to blow your mind. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He wasn't confused. It didn't take him by surprise. He knew. He knew what his mission was. He knew how the Messiah was going to die. He knew it because he knew Scripture and he was so close with God. He was so full of the Holy Spirit. He knew what was going to happen. So now he's going to start saying very plainly what's going to happen. But if you aren't in kind of their mindset, you won't really be able to pick it up. It will seem like they're just doing a political repartee and Jesus gets the best of people. But that's not really what's happening. So at the beginning of chapter 12, Jesus starts to teach in parables. And he says, a man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, built a tower, leased it to the tenants, and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Now, Isaac did a marvelous job uh, talking through this parable. I don't feel the need to, to, to remind the whole thing. But Jesus is saying, very openly, he's turning into the Bible that he had at that time, which is what we call the Old Testament. And he was just saying, let's look at Scripture together. Let's do that. And he's just he's just telling us a, a, a parable that comes right out of Scripture, out of the book of Isaiah. And then they understand that Jesus is talking about them. They understand that they are the ones who, have, who God entrusted the true worship of the one true God Two, and instead of making it about the good and true and right worship of God, they made it about their own benefit, their own power, their own control over people and land and stuff. They thought, they really thought, that if they did a good enough job manipulating the world around them, that God would have to use them. And it really ticked them off that God would send someone who didn't care that they were such marvelous manipulators. In fact, he went, God's not like that. That really made them angry. And now Jesus is saying, teaching in the temple courtyard to everybody. There was nobody who left this little scene and didn't go, oh, snap! Did you just hear what Jesus from Nazareth said to them? Oh, he has got their number. They're not going to let this go. They're not going to let this go. You're talking about entrenched, bureaucratic, powerful people who had everything to lose. So look at verse 13. They sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. Now, the Pharisees and the Herodians, this is like in America seeing the very far left meeting up with the the very far right and getting together to go get somebody politically, destroy somebody politically. The Pharisees were about, were about making certain concessions to Rome, but being as separate as possible, creating as much Jewish culture as possible in order to keep the Jewish people separate. And the Herodians were like, 
No, let's go full Greek. Let's go full secular. Let's get rid of our culture. Let's grab the reins of power. Let's build big stuff. Let's be the best secular people all around. And that's how we'll make a name for ourselves. Now, these two crowds are together realizing the imminent political threat of Jesus Christ. And they're going to to get him. Verse 14, they came to him and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true. Do you remember the deal with the rich young ruler? When he said, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good. This is dripping with sarcasm. These guys don't just don't mean it. But they're trying to push him off a cliff by saying, okay, so we know that you're the, the one true. We know that you're, you don't care about man's opinion. Who are we? Just the most learned people on the face of the earth when it comes to worshiping the one true God. Oh, but don't mind us. The guy from Nazareth has got it all figured out. We know that you're the one true teacher. You don't care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This, should we pay them or should we not? The two groups that are presenting this to him have exactly opposite opinions. The Pharisees have the opinion, you don't pay taxes to Caesar. He's evil. He's bad. You're feeding the monster. Be true to God and don't pay your taxes. And the Herodians are like, those guys over there are the problem. They're why people hate us. Don't just pay your taxes. Volunteer to collect taxes. Collect more than you need. Let's be the best taxpayers the Romans have and let's earn the favor of the government. These two groups are attacking Jesus and they're saying, pick a side. What is Jesus going to say? But knowing their hypocrisy, this means he knows that they're acting, that they're pretending, that they don't care. What he has to say, no matter how he answers this, they're going to get him. He said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You want to know why they're marveling? Because they, they just, they just set him up for the biggest fall in the world. And Jesus just not only pointed out what they were doing, he walked around and gave him a swift kick in the butt on his way around the trap. And they fell into it. Now everybody who's listening to this is going, oh. he just did that? You know what it reminds me of? Just a quick break here. When I was a kid, my mom and dad had these two old horses named Nakona and Dub. And Dub was a quarter horse. And they were old. And they were arthritic. And they were kind of crabby. And uh, they didn't get ridden very often. But every once in a while, um, you know, they taught us older kids how to put on the tack and the bridle and all that kind of stuff, and you could try to ride them. So one time I put on the saddle and put on the bridle, and I was going to try to ride Dub around the field. Not only was he old and arthritic and kind of crabby, he was also like half blind. And, um, and I didn't know at the time, but horses have, have to develop a relationship with the person who's riding them. And so, being like 12 or 13 or whatever I was, uh, Dub did not trust me and my judgment. 
So we're going out into the field, and I had seen my mom run the horses across the field from one end to the other at a full, at a full gallop. And uh, all I had ever done was just canter with the horse. If you've ever taken a horse on a canter, it's awful. <laughs> it just beats your kidneys. You're just like bouncing like this. Or you walk, you know, and I didn't walk and I really didn't want to canter. So I, so I pointed, I, I got to the edge of the field and uh, over by the road and I pointed him across to try to get through the fence line all the way to the, end of the other end of the 20 acres. And I gave him a kick and he started walking, gave him another kick and he started cantering, gave him another kick. He didn't really want to start galloping, but I was insistent, no, go, go, go. And so he started galloping. And he started going, and I'm trying to kind of aim him with the bridle uh, at the gap in the fence. And as I got closer, I could see there was a big ball of wire that was kind of in the gap of the fence. And I was trying to steer him around the wire, but he didn't trust me. And so as we're getting closer and closer to this ball of wire that he doesn't see, I'm pulling harder and harder on the reins, but that horse had a stiff neck. And he was putting it, and I, I, his mouth was all the way to the side, but he was straining hard against it. He did not want to turn. He had become used to the way that he had done things along the path that he walked, and he could not see the wire. And he ran smack into it, and it was a, it was a nightmare. I, I, I think I bailed. I just, I just went, nope. <laughs> Jumped off the horse at a full gallop, hit the dirt, he hit the wire, he, he went flopping around and, and it, took, it was a huge mess. This is what's happening right here in the text. Jesus is trying to steer, to steer the people and their leadership around the ball of wire, but their, their neck is stiff and they won't. They won't. People get like that. When they feel threatened, when people feel like their backs are against the wall, they become totally uncharitable. They become totally miserly. They grab onto the things that they think are theirs. And they put out their claws and they will viciously attack anyone that they think is going to threaten it. They're not done with Jesus. They're determined to take him down. Here come the Sadducees, verse 18. The Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. The Bible is just giving you the heads up of what is in their creed because there were people who were going to be reading the book of Mark who'd never heard of the Sadducees. So they say there's no resurrection. After you die, that's it. You're a hunk of meat with a brain that works or thinks it works. Now, one day that meat's going to just stop working and then it's over. It's, it's done. That's what they taught. How did they get there from the faithful worship of the one true God? Well, they're going to show us. They asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Remember, we did this in Deuteronomy, the, the leveret marriage in, Levit, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, 24 and 25. The problem was widows in the old days, the orphan and the widow were people who did not belong to a house. They had no ability to self-rescue because of the way the society was structured. And so, if a woman's husband died, her, his brother would go in and, and give her a child so that that child could then uh, be a male heir who could conduct the business of the household and that widow would now have uh, an ability to operate in the world. It was God's way of rescuing people who had no rescue. There is never a record of a leveret marriage happening more than once. Did you know that? That every time in which there is a leveret marriage, God has seen fit to give a male heir to the widow. 
but not in their hypothetical situation. Verse 20. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife. When he died, left no offspring. The second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. Boy, you can't really count on God's grace, can you? Not in their world. What if the first one, then the second one, then the third one? And the seven left, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In their world, their reality that they're living in, God is incredibly inhospitable. He doesn't care about you. You go in to do the right thing to take care of the widow. He's not going to care about you. He's not going to care about the widow. When they die, what's up? No, they had made up this situation. It's called a hypothetical situation. There's no record of this ever happening. It only shows their view of God's generosity and God's ability to rescue and save. So now, in their hypothetical situation, every single one of them is dead. Verse 23, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Do you, do you see their argument? It's kind of hard to see. But they're arguing if the Bible says that when two people get married, they become one. Jesus said that himself. Therefore, what God has put together, let no man separate. Jesus taught that divorce wasn't good. And he was the first guy to say that because Moses said, you can, you can get a divorce. When you do, you should do it this way. Jesus said, yes, but that's because you guys all got hard hearts. God doesn't want that. The law was making a provision. In this instance also, God's law is making a provision for when something that is against God's will happens anyway. So those two have become one flesh. Well, then, if they die together as an old married couple, then in the resurrection, sure, they're still married. But what happens with the leveret marriage? Let me take it to the utmost extreme. Seven brothers, one wife, she goes down the line, has no children, all seven brothers die, she dies as well. Now who's she going to belong to? They were making in their imaginations a ridiculous situation, and rather than coming to the conclusion, we have ridiculous imaginations, they came to the conclusion because this is a ridiculous situation, therefore, resurrection is ridiculous. This way of arguing is still done today. I remember when air marshals were becoming a thing, and the people who were against it argued, what's going to happen if terrorists come out, and then the air marshals have their guns, there's going to be shoot out in the sky, everybody's going to die, and that's ridiculous, we shouldn't have air marshals. People still do it. Jesus, in verse 24, he said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? So he's saying, let me tell you why you're wrong. Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. There's two things that the Sadducees had working against them. First, they didn't really know the Bible. They thought they knew the Bible. They walked around and acted like they knew the Bible because here was this verse in, in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and they could quote it and then they had, they could do a bunch of things with it and come to their own logical conclusion. And he said, you don't know the scripture. And second, you don't know the power of God. If you, if that's your ridiculous thing, your ridiculous conclusion that you're coming to, you don't know the Lord. You really shouldn't be teaching people. Verse 25, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now this, I don't know where that's written in the Old Testament. I don't know where Jesus is getting that, save for the fact that he's God. And he knows. He was full of the Spirit. Maybe he had watched people die. Maybe he knew. 
In verse 26, he says, as for the dead being raised, so verse 25, he was saying, this is the power of God that you are unaware of. Verse 26, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, this, this, this is like a triple burn. Because he's saying, if you look in the Bible, the part that Moses wrote, if you look there, there's a section where the, where there's a bush. That's, that's where you'll find it. Because he's remarking on how incredibly ignorant they are of the scriptures. So the crowd here is, is making sizzling sounds. How God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Do you know what the next line in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 is? And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Here the Sadducees were looking God in the face and they could not recognize him. And they're quoting from a Bible that recognizes him. Their ignorance is so completely out of this world, Jesus is flabbergasted. And he's very easily pointing out how incredibly naive and ignorant and stupid and self-centered they are. They don't know who God is, and they don't even know the scripture. Jesus' conclusion, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. This is the literary equivalent to drop kicking someone in the chest. I mean, Jesus just went slap, 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 karate chop, kick, and the Sadducees go flying. You are quite wrong. Of course, they have no answer. Verse 28 is incredible because in the book of Mark, we find little hints dropped all up till now. There are people of God out there that you wouldn't suspect. People that you think would be farthest from God who actually are sitting in his living room. I mean, don't you remember the demoniac in the Gerasenes? He was the first one, other than the disciples, who actually followed Jesus, said, I want to follow you. Don't you remember the Syrophoenician woman who hunted him down, and even after he said, look, I'm here for the kids, and quite honestly, you're one of the dogs in the house. And she said, yeah, but even the dogs got a little kibble. Come on, give me something. And here we have, even in the party of, oh, uh, and also the man that the disciples did not know, who is rejecting demons and, and sending them out in Jesus' name. The disciples are like, we don't even know that Yahoo. He won't stop. Jesus says, uh, don't stop him. It's not about you. It's about me. And now here, in verse 28 of chapter 12, we have this amazing, because the scribes and the Pharisees, they're dark, dark, dark. That's how Mark paints them. The elders, they're dark, they're murderous, they're evil, except for the ones who aren't. And here Jesus has a conversation with one. He says, uh, verse 28 says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is called the Shema. And it's, to this day, a central Jewish prayer. So Jesus is, is giving an obvious Jewish answer. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. When uh, the first century Jews were teaching their children, this is what they would teach them about their faith. It's kind of like when we sing Jesus Loves Me. Like it's a kid's song, but it's full of truth. Or we sing Make Me a Servant or Thank You, Lord, that teaches our children the very basics of what it means to be a believer. This is what Jesus is doing. 
He is not despising the little and base things, and he's giving this as a professional answer. I mean, it'd be like if I went to a conference and they said, all right, Reverend Paul, what what do you teach people? Where are you at? What? And I said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's what we're all about. And that's what he's saying to the scribe. you got to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment, singular, there is no other commandment greater than these. It's the same commandment. Jesus teaches us this himself. He's not saying there's two commandments that we have to follow. Love God with all your heart and soul and then love other people. Like, you could do one really well without doing the other one really well. He's saying, no, these are the same thing. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. The people who really love God, they love other people. There is no other commandment greater than these. 32. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This was the end of the showdown. Almost. Now Jesus is going to go on the offensive a little bit. Now that he has diffused all of the bombs they have thrown at him, he's going to lay down two giant principles for the crowds to understand. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, so can you imagine all of these questions and the repartee is done? Now Jesus turns and he says, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? And the crowds go, hmm? The Messiah definitely comes from David. Everybody knows that. Yeah, but, but these scribes here, they have a question that they need to answer. How can they say that he's the son of David? Because David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great thong, throng heard him gladly. I'm not sure if they were wearing thongs or not, but the great throng heard him gladly. So what he's saying is, in the Jewish way of thinking, the father is always greater than the son. Always. Uh, and as the generations go down, you have more of a place of honor and worthiness and authority. So a grandpa is, is treated with even more reverence and respect. So how can David say that God said to my Lord, the Messiah? How can David call him a Lord that violates the norm? How can that be true? Well, if you logically work it out, it can only be true if David's son is God himself. They're left with this conundrum and Jesus drops it in their lap straight from the scriptures and they have no answer. Verse 38, And in his teaching, he said, now this is where he gets a little personal, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They're, they're sitting right there. They're standing right there. They just had a conversation, and Jesus just humiliated their their pride. He humiliated their lack of understanding. They came at him with knives and he had a sword. 
He had the word of God and he's using it way better than they can. They're standing right there and Jesus exposes their ignorance to the scripture. And then he turns to the crowd and says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. And they devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. I think this is where people are actually going like, whoa, this, that's a little much. But Jesus knows what he's going into. He doesn't want there to be a shadow of doubt in anybody's mind exactly who he is and exactly what role the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the existing um organization, what role it's going to play. Now, he's in the temple and he goes and sits down right across from the offering box. Imagine if I stopped preaching and I walked around here and I started watching the tithe box. And you all on your way made a habit on your way out or on, on during the day to drop offerings in the box. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Do you know, do you know what the off- offering box was for? It was for caring for the poor. That's what it was for. It wasn't for sacrifices. It wasn't like we do it today. Actually, it was very similar to how we do it today, except today, All of our giving goes in one place, and they would put it in different avenues. They took care of the priest, they took care of the temple, and they took care of the poor. The offering box was the place in which they put their money to care for the poor. And here's a poor woman, a poor woman who has no house, has no income. She's putting her two pennies into the box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, she put in everything she had. All that she had to live on. I think this just comes out of the fact that Jesus was truly full of the Holy Spirit and he knew what this widow was doing. Reminds me of when I go and uh, preach down at the Union Gospel Mission and they make a habit of taking an offering of the homeless people at every service. And they say, we don't ask that anybody give under compulsion, but everyone should have the opportunity to serve God and give Him money with a cheerful heart. And they pass it among the homeless people who are there using the services of all the money that people give to take care of the poor, but it's important that the poor people give too. This is an obvious distinction between the scribes and the Pharisees, the existing organization, and the widow. They had no problem going in and confiscating property or doing what they had to do in order to get their paycheck. They didn't care about the poor. This is how Jesus knew that they didn't care about God. This widow outgives everyone because God doesn't care how much you give. God is not impressed by a large check dropped into the offering box. He cares about what it means to you. There's something that happens when our neck is not stiff. There's something that happens when we begin to trust God And when he starts pulling us, even though it's off the path that we're used to, 
He can see what's ahead in the road. And we have to sacrifice what we think needs to happen in order for God to have his way. When we are dependent on God in such a way, we are always spiritually growing. The scribes and the Pharisees were not spiritually growing. This widow, she was a giant. And I think that oftentimes God uses the poor and the humble, those who are willing to sacrifice. And for some reason, because we're human, it's easier to sacrifice when you're poor. If you've ever had a stretch making very little money, and then you get a big giant check for whatever reason, and maybe it's not big and giant to other people, but it's huge to you, and all of a sudden you're looking at the tithe on it, and you're like, whoa, I'm used to tithing 10 bucks. You know? 100 bucks is a lot of money to be dropping in the plate. 1,000 bucks is a lot of money to drop in the plate. $10,000 is a lot of money to drop in the plate. And it is. But it's no more than the $10 ever was. No more. And the more that we give of what it costs us, of what it causes us to be dependent on God for, the more we grow. Don't ever hear me say, you can't outgive God in the material sense. Yes, you can. That's what fasting is for. That's what giving is for is you're giving more than you're receiving. But you cannot outgive God in the sense that when you depend upon him, there are always rich treasures to be had that can be had no other way. There is no other way to grow in faith than to depend on the Lord. And to not depend on the Lord is to have a stiff neck. This is why Christians are supposed to be different, like actually visibly different. We don't go into the store fist-fighting people over bleach when there's some sort of a scare. We don't get so scared that 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 we're like, stay away. We don't do that. We don't do it because we depend on God. And we know that the more that gets taken from us, the more we have an opportunity to give it away right before it gets taken. Christians have the ability to submit to God through whatever it is that's taking. We can say to the tax man, I'm actually, actually I'm giving this to God. Yeah, I'm sending it into the IRS, but actually I'm choosing to say, God, this is my sacrifice to you. We can say, I'm going to go without whatever it is because I'm sacrificing that to you, God. Learn from the widow. What would our lives be like if we were like Jesus? He's on his way. He's hours away from the cross. Hours. And he's giving of his time, his attention to the people who are about to be screaming at him and whipping him and spitting on him and making fun of him and stripping off his clothes and whipping him and killing him. He's looking into their eyes. He knows what they're about to do. But he is, he is so generous, so giving, even his life is not too much. Let us ask ourselves this question then, God, how can we more fully depend upon you? How can we fulfill your great commandment to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind, love our neighbor as we love ourselves? How can we do that right now, this week? How can we care for other people? What would our, our neighborhoods, what would our church community, what would our own heart look like if we were generous? because we're willing to depend on God. In his economy, this poor widow who gave everything, she's well taken care of. She can give everything. 
Because there are people all around who are giving too. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather in your name. We pray that you would keep that opportunity open to us. We pray that you would teach us to be generous, teach us to depend on you, not to have a stiff neck, not to be so so driven by our needs, by, by our wants, by the path that we are used to, that we are unwilling to go around a ball of barbed wire. Help us to trust you. Help us to depend on you. Show us some small measure, some just one penny adventure where we can put our dependence and our trust on you by loving other people. God, cause our reputation to be your reputation. That people would know that you are alive, that you are good, that you are worth following by our words, by our actions. And God, bless us as we go. We pray for our world right now which seems so upside down, which seems so full of fear, would you use us as a balm, as a salve, as as good, hearty, and cheerful medicine? We pray your blessing on each and every one of us. Amen.